we actually had a meet this exact same meeting with the first selectmen and with some members of your boards and commissions last I, week. I, I, uh, so, so that's that's. I, I'm sure she appreciates you, but she's hurt. Unfortunately, this is the second time for her. It's a rerun, so I do look out for her. Just uh, you guys, I'm sure a lot of you are, are more familiar with this area uh, than I am, and, and Ralph's pointed out some of this, but I'd rather be a little thorough and, and, and redundant than leave questions for folks if I can. So, uh, Snake Mountain Road runs along the, the west side of the, the site here, and this is uh, Snake Mountain Brook runs through the <coughs> western portion of the site and along here. There's an existing driveway into the site now with a, a uh, existing bridge or crossing here and a few existing buildings associated with the, the gravel operation on site. The town line uh, between uh, Plainfield and Sterling is, is right here. Uh, there's roughly eight acres in Sterling and uh, the balance of the 155 something like that is uh, in Plainfield. And the topography of the site, this is all sloping down you know, this direction. This is pretty steep over here, and then it uh, softens up a little bit, gets a little steeper, and softens up, and undulates a bit down through. But then, obviously, Snake Meadow uh, Brook is at the low point of the site, so everything drains pretty much almost due west to the site. There's some existing drainage uh, swales along the, the property line here that will uh, either be maintaining or relocating a portion of that with with the access road that we're proposing to the eastern part of the site. Uh, wetlands on the north side here will all stay in place and be part of a, a buffer from Snake Meadow Road where it swings around here on, on the north side of the site. It's still about 750, almost 800 feet from Snake Meadow Road to the closest proposed panels that, to, the, to the road in there. So uh, some of that's open, some of that's wooded. Uh, there's a Snake Meadow Club, I believe it's like a Shooting uh, plane and sort of thing. Gun club? Yeah. So that helps get people oriented a little bit. Um, so, All Points Technology has, has flagged the, the wetlands and done a lot of other uh, environmental uh, evaluation on site, and we've incorporated that into the and work together with them to, to minimize those potential impacts. So there will be some clearing uh, necessary. This, this area is already all open. Uh, this part of the site is, is open now, but there's an area in the middle here that's uh, about 25% of the, the site would need to be cleared. The area that would be fenced for the, the system is uh, just under 85 acres. And as Ralph mentioned, there's a six foot security fence around the site. That's left about six inches above ground, typically around the site, to allow it selected so that it's not high maintenance. It'll be mowed a couple of times a year and they'll be out there monthly to, to check on things. Um, but, but proper maintenance of that is part of uh, the operation and maintenance plan that will be part of the submission package for the project and deal with things like that, panel maintenance, stormwater, system maintenance, things of that nature. There are detention days that we're going to provide any topo along the road? Um, yeah, we can <clears throat> jump into... I'm just curious how you're going to degrade the site from this massive grading. There's definitely some a fair amount of grading on the bottom of the site. So you can see where these darker lines are, are areas where we propose to change the, the contours of the site. All through the middle of the site, there's no proposal to change anything. And then, uh, on the back side of the other board is the, the rest of the site, and there's some, some regrading to be done on the far eastern end. These areas are uh, stormwater controls, where we would manage runoff. We've done uh, soil testing out here. We'll be doing 
uh, some infiltration and groundwater recharge <coughs> as part of the design. So there's a number of these uh, scattered around the site to both treat runoff before it goes back into the wetlands and make sure that we maintain flow to the wetlands so that they stay wet. We're not cutting off the flow or drying things out. There'll also be um, some of the access roads within the site uh, will be stone, washed stone that are porous then so we're not putting asphalt down to increase the uh, runoff from that. And these stone trenches will be infiltration trenches as well so they'll help with stormwater management and groundwater recharge. There's a 20 foot uh, separation at a minimum. Uh, we don't have the fence shown on, on this plan just for clarity, but from the, from the outside of the panels to the fence. So there's access all the way around inside, which is uh, a, a big concern for the owner. It's also something that the fire department's emergency services personnel uh, appreciate being able to get around the site a little bit easier. So. And soil erosion control will be developed for the site and uh, submitted as part of the package to the siting council. There'll be weekly uh, construction period observation of all the erosion control features and how that's functioning. Those are sort of the, the high level pieces of the engineering. I can uh, answer specific questions now. It might make more sense to, uh, to get a little bit more of the environmental piece of things first though. But, I believe the interconnection is on Snake Meadow Road, uh, essentially right where the driveway, uh, at Snake Meadow Road, essentially where the existing driveway connects. So we'd be, the interconnect would be out here, so. Where's it coming from? that have been identified. Uh, five of them are associated with Snake Meadow Brick, either directly through um, watershed runoff, or as you can see, these two wetlands located in the north um, west corner of the project that have been historically bisected by the existing Hall Road. The other three wetlands that are not associated with uh, Snake Meadow Brook is this wetland in the north central portion of the project. This is the wetland that has the most narrow buffer from the project to the wetlands. Generally, throughout the project, we've maintained at least a 50-foot separation from the edge of the fence line or the limit of disturbance to wetlands. Uh, in this case, with this wetland here, wetland A, um, due to the, as you can see, it's a very narrow hillside seep feature. It has periodic portions of, of water courses that are focused to the interior. It is very limited contributing drainage to this resource. Um, due to the nature and kind of the limited function and value of this assessment, it was not deemed that the 50-foot buffer to this wetland was really warranted. So in order to maximize, uh, you know, your bank, your buffer, your panels, and your panels are pushed up to uh, 15 feet of this wetland. Again, um, as my colleague stated, there's a very extensive process for developing erosion and sedimentation control to ensure that these wetland resources are protected during and post-construction. Uh, 
Uh, again, generally, the rest of the project more or less maintains a 50 foot buffer to all wetlands. And again, that's from the limit of disturbance to the wetlands. Um, as they were saying, there's another 25 feet between the fence line to the arrays that also provides buffer. It is proposed that in between the fencing and the wetlands, that it becomes uh, a more natural ecotone transition post construction. That means that rather than them coming out there yearly and mowing that area and essentially maintaining it as old field, it'll be allowed over a four to seven year, year period to more naturally revegetate, become a softer ecotone transition that's more beneficial for, for wildlife. There is a fairly diverse complex of habitats that are located on the site, ranging from various types of mature forest to open fields, uh, which is more or less more or less the central portion of the site is all edge forest, mature forest of various types. There are large open fields located to the east and west of the project, and obviously in the northwest corner there is the existing gravel operation that's still um, active. Generally about half of the project consists of forest clearing, or about 42 acres, with the remainder of the other 50% comprised of open field areas and the gravel pit. There is prime agricultural land out here, or prime farmland soils that have been identified on the project. However, um, all about six acres of those prime farmland soils have been historically manipulated through the gravel operation. Things like stripping of the topsoil, heavy you know, topography manipulation, those types of activities associated with the, the operation. So there's very little prime agricultural land that is being proposed to be disturbed by the project. And this is all, it is all very shallow, you know, soil, till soils, um, similar to almost all soils in this region. It's very bony. You'll have you know, exposed surficial bedrock, which is more or less just large boulders that have been dropped out during the glacial till. Um, the glacier receded. It dropped all the stuff that it picked up, large stones, and dropped it down. So you do have a lot of very large stones, um, obviously with the gravel operation as well. They've manipulated some of, of that, and there are some larger rock piles that are very historic. Um, sure. Are you checked in the east? Do you have to we had here a few years back, maybe it was 2011. I was not aware. 21. <laughs> you got it. It was like 21 of them in a week. Oh, thank you. That's very interesting yeah, information. How would this stand up, you know? Okay. No, it's just a little bit. So the, the, the system is anchored with I beams they're about yeah, six, well, six, yeah. six to seven feet. You know, so a tremor, they could restrain the tremor. But if there is damage to the system, we're insured for it and we're insured to build yeah, the right. system. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. We'll we'll, we'll study it a little closer. I think we'll, we'll talk about it and uh and see what the impact this is. This is just for your benefit. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. That's why we yeah. come to the community. I don't know, right? <laughs> right? Your backyard, not my backyard. So it's a very important uh, item to for us to absorb and evaluate. They wasn't as bad as to say they knocked something off the shelf. Yeah. But they put cracks in the front, but yeah. the in the area. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's an item to consider because we'll put, we have some cement pads we put a put on, and maybe those pads need to be beefed up right, right. or done with a uh, different one. Well, select them probably to tell you more about it. Yeah. So we get that information off. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, A cemetery. If there's a cemetery on site, we, we will not be removing anything. We'll be working around it. Um, we don't have any footprint of a cemetery, uh, but you know, uh, again, if there's one there, we will get it. And uh, we walk the property thoroughly. So, do you have an idea of where it would be on site that you could point us in the right direction? Before or after you cross the brook? Okay, we'll definitely take a closer look at that. The limit of your work is all the next every day. Yeah.
that property that I've manipulated. I, I know the property of the well and you know, he said he has it's visible. You can buy Yeah, you can see it on the aerial here. Yeah, you're saying this, this whole, I mean, the, most of the property has been historically manipulated at one point or another, but this, that specific area that I think you're mentioning in this kind of northwest corner has been actively managed over the last, you know, five, ten years. So they're, and they're continuing to use that area for storage and pulling material out. Yes? Yeah, George Mars, I can live on uh, Lake Street and move something. This uh, array is going to be about two and a half miles from my house. I'm a ham radio operator, and uh, my concern is uh, the noise that people put out uh, so it keeps me from uh, using my ham radio. So, uh, has that been addressed in some of your other uh, locations? We, we do a noise study, uh, George. Uh, the system does make noise, but it, it is comparable to your dishwasher. So it's, it's I think it's, 50 and 45 decibels, it's it's lower than my voice right now. Does it confirm uh, or should I say uh, with the FCC in, 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 in reliance with their part 97, uh, like, you know, 307 for the spurless emissions, are you uh, going to be within those ranges? I am not an expert in that, but we hire experts to do a noise study, Sage Environmental, they have a noise uh, department. And so we'll have them do a nice study. It'll be part of the site process, most likely. Um, but I have many systems, and I'm sure there are other folks in your profession that have I, I've never had someone say, your system is interrupting my livelihood or my profession. That might be concerned. Yeah, yeah so but we're, we're, it's, it's something new that you mentioned. I've never been uh, questioned on it. So I, I would think we're not interrupting anyone's sound or quality. It's a very, they're very, uh, they're very low tone. If you're outside of the fence, you're not going to hear it. You'd have to be almost on top of the inverter. It's like if you were outside the front door, well, you get that FYI for you, uh, a lot of times uh, they get a bad transformer or you get a bad insulator. Uh, that'll affect our communications. It gets to the point where we can't uh, communicate anymore. They have to go out and find the area and replace that uh, insulator or transformer. Well, I think what you're referring to is like a, a more like a EMF or a static, yeah. a non-automatic sort of thing. RF, RF, RF. And, and you have an installation right adjacent to the TF Green Airport in Rhode Island, correct? Yeah. That, that you know, would, I'm sure would be the same FCC regulations as far as radio yeah, operation. That, that particular system, I did go through uh, an FAA uh, qualification study with it, and they did a noise study, they did a visual study. So. I'm not familiar with the terms that you use, but I'm sure I had to go through it. I had to hire a special FAA consultant to do those, those items. So I, I think I think it'll pass the test, but we'll test it. Very good, thank you. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. No, I wanted to clarify the same thing. Oh, you referring to RF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, does anyone have any more questions on that? I, uh, I'll go through a couple of other touch points that uh, died off on me, so I'll touch on them. Some of the, the direct impacts to the town financial benefits for the system is a taxable system, uh, they for each community, but based on the size of the system and other communities that I've worked in, the direct payment from, from the system will be in the $100,000 per year range. Uh, the system life is typically 25 to 30 years. It's, uh, it'll go on longer than that, but statistics show us that it may, it's, it's, it's uh, efficiency that you finish after that. Um, so I think it's safe to say 25 to 30 years. Uh, the utility upgrades uh, are taxable. I don't pay the tax on it. The utility installs new equipment, the community taxes it, so you get uh, additional uh, taxes from that. Uh, when we build projects, we have to get the uh, full permits. We pay for the fees to the local community. A system of this size, the construction jobs, uh, I can tell you that project right here is very simple, it's a little bit bigger. We had uh, just under 100 licensed electricians on the job uh, building, building that system for about four or five months, maybe a little bit more than five months. And we had uh, a lot of machine operators during the site process, you know, qualified machine operators. And during the construction, we have you know, the lower tone, 
machine operators, uh, moving material, and, and then uh, some uh, general laborers also. So a site like this could have upwards you know, over 100 people on site uh, of good paying jobs. After the system is built, uh, it, again, it's a very docile system. It just sits and there's very little to be tended to um, during that. And, you know, I, I think you know, it's not a changeable, the intangible, the common footprint in your community uh, is a good common statement. System. Just uh, trying to give you a, a, a touch point. A system like this is equivalent to taking 3,600 cars off the road from a carbon balancing standpoint. It's equivalent to 20,000 acres of quality forest in the carbon footprint. So that's just a, there's all types of statistics. How, you know, how many homes and a system like this can provide power. You know, the average, the average household absorbs about 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. The system will uh, generate about 24 million kilowatt hours a year. So about 2,400 homes, plus or minus, is a, is a, is a touch point that you can relate to the, the size and quality and, uh, and attribute of the system. So um, that's the presentation. Um, we've got some great questions, things I've, I've had considered, like the tremor and the, the, the FAA noise quality, but that we have to do noise studies, and I'll make sure I, I ask the question to, to address it, sir, the question. Yeah, my name's Scott Burris. Hi, Scott. You say, uh, the solar company doesn't pay the taxes on the bank. I do pay. I pay the direct taxes. The system, the company pays the taxes. The utility upgrades that we make, we pay for the upgrades, Scott, but we donate the upgrades to the utility company. Once we, in, we pay for them, they're installed, we don't own them. The, the grid owns them, okay? And then they get it for free, but they're assessed, and the grid pays taxes to the local community. I worked all the way for over 40 years. Yeah. I've traveled all over the world with these plants. Yeah. What type of power plants? Fossil fuel? Fossil fuel. Fossil burners, trash burners, yeah. wood burners, you name it. Yeah, yeah. You know, I believe that this country has to be turned around, and I think green energy is a big factor. But at the same token, it's a matter of where you put it. I agree. There's a balance to it. You know, there's a balance. We can't just rush in and say we're going to take all fossil fuel offline. You can't. You, you can't do it. Because you know, a lot of the, the green energy is intermittent energy, and the world does not work on an intermittent basis, right? We need, still need fossil fuel for base water power. power. Excuse me. You've got to have trash. Okay. I understand. There's a lot to be fueled. There's a lot that has to evolve, and it can't be overnight. It has to be a, a well thought out evolution of where fossil fuel is going down and renewable energy is going up. Because we have to have a stable grid. Because you know uh, we're spoiled here. When we want the lights on. We want the lights on. Exactly. Yeah. We import a lot of our green energy from Massachusetts. I yeah. Understand. Yeah. We import a heck of a lot of our green yeah. energy from that state. Now, as the state legislation, legislation, you guys need to come in. No, it's not a problem. As the state legislation uh, changes policy as far as solar goes. I'll let, I'll let Craig answer that because Craig is into it. From my understanding of this, you had to have buildings on site where you, you were going to put your solar farm in order to have an industrial solar farm. There's a couple of different ways that we've done it in Connecticut. Um, one way is supervised by the State Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. The state has circulated a number of RFPs. Uh, and these RFPs are proposals to sell electricity to the two electrical distribution companies for distribution to their customers. So the state says, okay, Connecticut Lightning Power, you need to buy a certain amount of solar energy. We're going to do an RFP. We're going to find the right entity for you to buy that electricity from, and then you have to enter into a power purchase agreement with that. And that just goes into the grid that way. So there's no building on site that you're you're powering or is no town hall or 
or company or anything. It goes into the grid. All of us use it as part of our electricity. The Did other that transaction, Scott, typically is out of state. The facility, so the renewable energy facility, the wind or energy is out of state. <coughs> the transmission line. That's you know, it's not in state. It's not improving your green energy <coughs> when you're using green energy. This system is being built within the state lines. Well, yeah. Right, but now there's another way that, that these facilities can make a business arrangement. Connecticut had a pilot program that was passed in 2015 that allowed for municipalities, state agencies, and farms to do something called uh, virtual net metering, which means one of these facilities exists. It's not on their property. They don't physically connect to it, but they can um, have a business relationship with them where they can purchase the credits that this, this, this facility generates and use that to pay their electrical bills. So there's a there's a, 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 a ability to do that. But we only, we only had a very, very small cap in Connecticut on that, and we only had three different types of users that you could do that with. Now, all of that stuff that I just talked about has expired. So in the legislature right now, the, the, the legislators are considering how they're going to continue this program. Are they going to do more uh, virtual net metering? Are they going to do more RFPs? Is it going to be a combination of both? Are they going to lift the caps? Are they going to raise the caps? All of that is, is being decided. And as we all know, our legislature is never in a hurry to do anything. So we're not going to know exactly where they come out on this, probably until the end of May, the beginning of June, when the legislative session finishes up. To further complicate things, there's also a process in, at, at the Public Utility Regulatory Authority to, to, to find a third way in which a, a, a business like this could sell its electricity. And that's called a, uh, a feeder tariff, which means that Southern Sky could connect to CLMP's grid, and then CLMP could uh, impose a fee on them, um, both for connection and then ongoing maintenance to sell them their electricity and to be involved in that. So there's three different ways Please forgive me for being complicated. I wish I could make it easier to understand, but it's, it is a little bit complicated. But that, there, are, there are ways you can do it. We know that sometime this year, they're gonna allow one of those three things to, to, be, to be in place. And so that's what Southern Sky is banking on, is that, that if, if one of those three mechanisms will be available to them to sell electricity. Um, so they're moving ahead. They're getting everything um, uh, finalized. As you can tell from all of this uh, information that's being presented, it's a highly regulated um, business, and the state really looks at all of the details of what you're doing, the land you're doing it on, what the impacts are going to be. So it takes a lot of time to get one of these things to the point where you can actually initiate construction. So Southern Sky is, is taking the initiative, and they're getting out there and getting all of that planning work done so once there's a there's a there's a mechanism to sell the electricity, they can be ready to move ahead. If there's no mechanism right now, if so this is over right now, hook up to the main grid. There isn't one. There isn't one available right now. Right. Yes. Now, when it comes down to that change of legislation, are they going to put a cap statewide on per megawatts? How many megawatts can you have in a state like I think Massachusetts? Is 
and a quarterback. So that they, each state is evolving to serve different masters like you speak of. It is, you know, Frank said, there's feed-in tariffs, there's virtual net metering tariffs. We've done both transactions very successfully elsewhere, so I'm very familiar with them. In Massachusetts and Rhode Island, I did the same thing. I got in when there was rumor in pilot programs to get to get renewable energy going. That's you know, I got in in front of the market, I made some speculative investments on land and approval processes. And it turned out to work out. And I think the same thing is going to hear, happen here in Connecticut. Um, you know, you can just see the patterns look very similar to all the states that I've operated in. Now, you feel confident enough to build a 170 million dollar solar farm that the legislation will change the way you can tie into the main grid. You can tie that in some solar school, yeah. maybe, yeah. or sell it to yeah. maybe a big factory. Yeah, sure. by, you know. So the best way to answer that question, Scott, is to say I'm crazy, but I'm not nuts. Right? Yeah, you ain't I'm, 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 I'm crazy enough yeah, sure. to come out and, you know, this is an expensive process. You can wish up on the paper, but it's expensive. But what's really expensive is building the system. If I don't get a program that accepts a solar system, to build the system would be insane. Right. Okay. To to speculate and spend the money that you know the Southern Sky is spending right now to go through the siting process, that's reasonable. I can measure my exposure, but to build a system and then hope for the program, I, but I'm confident. You know, I, I really wouldn't be doing this if I wasn't confident that Connecticut is going to evolve to a similar pattern for its neighboring states to have to do with New York, Rhode Island, okay. Massachusetts. Okay. 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 Too, because it's got to be green energy. Look, look at China. They built thousands of acres in rice fields that are damn well. Yeah. yeah. These panels, you know. Well, they recognize, you know, they got a pollution problem. They you have to wear a smog mask in a lot of the major city, Scott. And, you know, that's a reflection of they got to do something different. Yeah. And, like you say, every state is different when it comes to solar. Yeah. You know, I believe, I, I don't see solar as a big wind. Slowly get out of that business when they got deregulated. And that was a dirty, you know, those plants were pretty intense. So the government did get the chance to clean up these scrubbers and freeze it. Okay, but a lot of them didn't. It's too expensive. Why? It's too expensive. And yeah, they shut a lot of them down in Virginia. Yeah. I'm wondering, excuse me. Um, depending on what the state legislator decides, what they can do, what they decide, because that's going to impact the amount. That you can pay the town, you were saying that the town is going to expect another $100,000. Well, so it would depend on what the General Assembly did. My, my bet is that the General Assembly is going to create a program that's big enough for that this project will probably be a rounding error to the overall project. You know, Massachusetts is the first phase was 1,600 megawatts. This is 18 megawatts. And now they're in the second phase. This, I think there's another 1,000 megawatts rolling around. Okay? So I think something similar is going to happen. I don't think there's any different than uh, Massachusetts in scale. Um, you know, so I think something similar will happen. Uh, what, you're, what you're stating could happen. Maybe they don't. You know, maybe they don't. If they don't come out with a robust program, it would be insane for me to build a project. The right program has to come out. I'm confident in moving in that direction. Did what I answer your question? What are you using in your pro forma? What is your number? I mean, are we talking like 11 cents a kilowatt? I mean, yeah, it's a little double, double digits makes it work. Yeah. And you said that you, you haven't been to the site council, so there's no power purchase agreement in place. You're just, right now, this is pure speculation. I am speculating, all right? But I'm speculating with the measure. Right. Right. The site council, they say yes, we want. They would throw me out on my application, right? So they said, 
So if they wouldn't waste their time. I think they would be sold here and they would say, yes, I don't waste your money, just try to go away. You know, that, that's not happening. And it's just, the, you know, it's what Scott said. Everybody's moving to, to green energy. Jeff shapes and forms, solar, wind, biomass, you know, uh, geo, geotherm, there's many different ways to go about it. But I'm confident this team on the state is moving in that direction. Here's one other thing to keep in mind, which is, which I think should make the communities feel a little bit better. Um, what happened a lot in the last couple of years in Connecticut, because you know how we tend to be somewhat unpredictable when it comes to working with businesses. Many of the, the, the folks that applied for these RFPs and even won the RFPs hadn't done some of this initial planning that's been done here today. And so when they actually got to the, to the planning and took a look at how many acres they could really put solar panels on or there were some wind projects or some other things, they weren't able to satisfy the, the request for proposal after all. And so those, pro, those projects have either been very delayed or never happened at all. And we've seen a lot of that in Connecticut. The good part about this is, is that this project will know what its capacity is before it makes that first proposal. They're not speculating on their ability to do so. There's a lot of good hard data here. So this is a well thought out project. It costs a little bit more money to do it that way. A lot of people would rather have that proposal to purchase the electricity in hand before they spend their first dollar or spend as little as they have to. That's not the case here. They're, they're, they're figuring that out as, as they go in. So hopefully we can avoid a situation where they'll have to pull back because there's not enough money in the deal. Is, it, is there a solar farm up and running right now in the state of Connecticut? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, there is. Yeah, sure. There was on the previous pilot programs, just a couple of them of similar size. Uh, here, uh, there's a 20 megawatt one. Uh, Company called RES Solar built it. Uh, it was on one of these ISO New England Power Purchase Agreement uh, RFPs. It's one or two communities over. It's not far. It might be 10 miles Franklin. by the pro price. You know, it's in Franklin. Is it Franklin? Is that close by now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's an industrial farm. All right, 20 megawatts. It's got 180 Scott, so yeah. Right. yeah. And that's up and running, you say? It's up and running. It's plugged in. There are a number, there's another one across from Don Stadium in Norwich. There's several on a few of the landfills in Norwich as well. Um, there's another in Basra, there's another in uh, Rocky Hill, and there's one in Sprague, a fairly large one in Sprague that is about the same size as this, a little bit larger actually. In the aggregate, there might be 100 megawatts installed in the aggregate, I'm guessing from what I know, but that's, you know, it's not, it was a, more or less a pilot program. Now, are they hooked up to Con Ed or for yeah, they, they have to be hooked up to one of the utilities. I doubt, Scott, that one of them is just hooked up to a manufacturing building or something similar to that that's fitting to be the backwards of the net metering program. That's too big of a system to do that. You need to be plugged into the grid. Now, what if we have the transformers within, within say if we have transformers within uh, 200 yards of the solar field with the transmission line? My experience is the sub-transmission you can tie into, 23 kV, grid 4. When you try and tie into the major transmission, the grid doesn't do that. Well, see, these lines are right at 37 megawatts. Yeah. I think the lady over here had a question. <laughs> yes, I've, I've been waiting. Um, other than actually paying taxes to our town and um, providing jobs to some people which may or may not be from our town. Is there a way that residents of Plainfield might be able to get discounted electricity through this source? Or is that just going straight to the grid and we pay for what we get? Here's one possibility that might help the town of, of Plainfield. There's a possibility and we don't know what's going to happen at the legislature. They had their first series of public hearings day before yesterday. So they're in, the, they're in the beginning of their process. But if they raise the cap on virtual net metering, and which means that they allow some more towns to get involved in that, 
the town of Plainfield could actually enter into an agreement with this electrical provider, this electrical generator, and purchase the electricity at a discounted rate for the town. Okay. From this, so the this, town buildings could get the discount. Well, for any of that the town's still helps the town. it would go against the town's electrical bills. So any bills that the town has as an electrical bill could possibly be done. That would be one way. Unfortunately, there's no mechanism under discussion right now that I know of for an individual like you or I to mm -hmm. purchase from from them. But uh, the town certainly could if they, and, and I know one of the bills proposed is to eliminate the caps on virtual net metering so that the town could certainly afford itself that. And usually it does provide a nice discount and it's green, a green source yeah. of energy. Oh, I'm all in favor of it in general. I just had a couple of specific questions. The, the, common, the common mechanism is called community solar, for what you're asking on a residential basis. Rhode Island has a, a modest cap. They have, I think it's 10 megawatts. Is it 10 megawatts and 5 megawatts for community solar? So community solar, if I build a 1 megawatt system, and that system produces a million, 1.3, 1.4 million kilowatt hours a year. An average house absorbs about 10,000 kilowatt hours a year. So if I aggregated 130 homes and allocated the, the electricity, and I'd have to send out 130 bills, and you know, <laughs> that's not what I do. Right. There are programs that support that. What I typically do is build a utility scale system, and find a municipal community or a state agency, and we sell it in bulk, and you know, the transaction works very efficiently like that. But there are programs in other states. I, I can only imagine that Connecticut is going to follow that path. You know, I hope it's, just, so. it's just momentum. I hope so. Too. So you're saying Bridgeport and Hartford and New Haven will get all the electricity that generates from this wall And it'll just go well. Through. It depends on the program. Oh. But you're right. The economic benefit, if the legislature says we're only going to do state agencies, okay, get the benefit of the system. From the electricity discount perspective, the tax revenue from the system, the local community will get, but the electricity discount benefit will go elsewhere. If, as Craig stated, if they do a municipal, if the municipalities become an eligible common body, the local community has the option to participate. What's the initial cost of the system? What's going to cost to build that system? What are we being, what are we as a town taxing? Uh, it depends what equipment I use, but it could range from $25 to $35 million to install. So how did you come up with the number of $90,000? I'm really curious. How you got well, it's, it's, it's what I typically pay $5,000 per megawatt on, on a long-term basis. You know, that system, when you first install it, yes, it has high value. The equipment appreciates over seven years and gets down to next to nothing. Mm -hmm. Typical format. Next to nothing or 30%? Well, 30% is next to nothing after you make that investment. But then it, then it flows for 25 years. You stabilize it for 25 years. It's a similar number in Massachusetts and a similar number in Rhode Island. I, I expect it to, there's a statewide ordinance in, in Rhode Island that runs $5,000 per megawatt. And they had a big consultant come in, they did a fancy study, and they came up with $5,000 per megawatt. And they had something done in Massachusetts, very similar. And these systems that this system we talked about is replication of those systems. So, so is this number you're speaking of above and beyond the real estate value of that property? Because we tax property here. Uh, it is. Yeah, this is can that's tangible, but so if you have a thirty million dollar simple map development, we're coming in at twenty eight mils. Yeah. That translates into a lot more than ninety thousand. Yes, yeah, so you took the 25-year agreement that contemplates the appreciation of the system and averages it up. Is this going to be a purchase property or a lease? This is a lease property. Is there any reclamation bonds or anything for the property when it's finished? Uh, every system that we build it, we put up a decommissioning escrow on a bond, it'll be up to be a 25-year bond. Put up a cap, we have an independent engineer, artist firm typically does it, 
they do a calculation of what the renewable minus scrap value is doing, and we present it to the town. The town usually has a consulting engineer in the first, but always going to agree on a number, and we put a cash bond up, and we do a tripod decommissioning gas program with the municipalities one party, the system owners one party, and the landowner is the third party. And you know, my, we built the system, we operated it for 25 to 30 years, we remove it, we get the cap, we get the bond back, we get the cash back. If we're a bad developer and we don't remove it, something happens, the municipality can pull the string and say we're going to use the cash to remove it. Is that same bond for ENS erosion and so on control on all that all at the end or uh, uh, the bond is typically to remove and replace and replace the, the system and the land and the back to its own state. So ENS would be in the beginning and as soon as you're done, someone come up and inspect, say it's okay, you get that bond back. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if the state of Connecticut requires to put an ENS bond. I don't think, I haven't heard that. If they do, or we'll why? But typically, I, I, I've well, never it, done that. It shows your building detention basin for more than one of the things. <coughs> Typically not. We do it to spec, and if we do it right, the, the regulatory authorities come out and spec and say you did it right, and, that, and that's it. Typically not. I, I've never experienced that in the community. Yeah, I'm not aware of it. Yeah. Well, the project this size, it goes through deep stormwater. They have to approve a project this size. Um, through the general permit that kinds of works under, they require both direct construction monitoring and a post-construction, essentially, fully complete, fully stable. Um, inspection as well that gets sent to DEEP and they have to sign off as well and say, yes, we agree, this is 100% stable, no, we're not seeing erosive patterns, it's more than 70% germinated, um, those kind of metrics for them to sign off and say, the site is fully built and fully stable, you know, you've, you've gone through your necessary requirements for the general permits. And for the decommissioning estimate, we usually assume you know, that the site will be disturbed again some portion of it will be, and so there's a, a, a line item in there for erosion control during decommissioning and stabilizing the site after that. So it's accounted for at the end in that mechanism. I mean, obviously, there are two ways to decommission as you Six feet, a typical panel, and 
panels we use, we've been densing about 400 watts into those panels. And typically, most developers will use a 340 to a 360 watt panel because they're much cheaper than two generations ago. My investor, you know, I'm forced to stay on top of the technology curve. And stay on top of the technology curve anyways, because in the long run, it's bad. To that point, I, I mean, every year we've seen an average of 3% increase in efficiency. Have you looked any further than the 30-year lifespan or 25-year lifespan, maybe re-signing another 20, 30-year lease with new and more efficient panels? I, my, my lease with property only was out 35 years, with my discretion. Um, you know, the panels, you know, what could typically happen 15 years out? Somebody could invent a panel that's half the size and twice as efficient, you know, and it's inexpensive, but I take half the system down and replace it. I'm governed, once I get into the action services agreement, I'm governed on the AC insert. I, you know, I, I, just because a more efficient panel comes out, I buy them, I'll try and double the size of the system, I'll never get into the action services agreement. So I'll never, it won't be allowed, because I'm going to be governed at the size of the system today. But that doesn't prevent me from chopping the system in half, taking it half of it down, and putting those double efficiency panels if they ever get to that point 10, 15 years down the road. Those types of things can happen. Uh, right now, you know, the, the, the economics is structured. What we have today in the for technology, and if something better happens in the future, we can react. It's unpredictable, but it's, it's a great question. It's, if we, we were talking 10 years ago, the pianos were like 200 watts, and they were bigger, and you know, they're not at 400 watts, and they're smaller. So it is happening. When the panels, is there like, um, where are they disposed? So I buy panels from LG, Life's Good. Uh, LG has, as part of my purchase price, there's an amount of money in the purchase price, that they take them back, and they have a recycling program uh, in their own factories. I can't speak specifically how they do it. It's not, I, I don't know anything. But my investor is very concerned about you know, where they go afterwards. LG, I think, is the only pan manufacturer that has that program. And they also have the wherewithal. They're a Fortune 500 company. They have the wherewithal for sustainable. Like that. article that I read, there are some concerns with the pan issues in the construction of them. So I didn't know. Uh, we're looking at 20 years. Yeah. So th this system, we, we don't really have contaminants, glasses, you know, function of sand. Um, I'm not an expert in it, but I've been challenged on that. We do not use any toxic oils. We do have best oil in, in, the, in the transformers, but it's best oil like you would cook with. That type of best oil. Uh, we do not use chemicals to control the vegetation. It's natural to cut it and do that. So it's, it's an all natural process. Yes, we have metal in there, but you know, it's, 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 I think it's galvanized, so it doesn't, I'm trying to remember the technical term, so it doesn't rust. You know, we use all, you know, because it, it's not rusting from the technology. So we have all that preventative type of uh, equipment. We take precaution, you know, but, you know, whatever's available for us, we take precaution you know, so that. I recognize the scrutiny that I'm under uh, for that. So we try to take a very socially conscious approach to it. John Hancock is they have a, a, show, uh, a social conscious statement that I have to live by, and I'm happy to that it's the right way to do it. Can you say you have 16 operations or you have? Is that what we're talking about? We have Lindsay uh, yeah. in, in what I am. In Rhode Island, and I'm installing probably another half a dozen as we speak. So we have how, seven. Yeah, seven how many fully deployed systems do you have right now? Uh, seven in Massachusetts and 16 in Rhode Island. And you know, within six months, I'll probably have four or five more. All different sizes. Do some you, small, some utility scale. All do you have sizes. any that you speculated on that, that are kind of like sitting offline or like dormant at all? Never. I never stop building a program unless I have a power contract. So I'll do this. I'll do the soft services, sir. Uh, but if I don't have a power contract, that is when I go from crazy to nuts, right? And I won't do that. You know? Is this considered an active or a passive system, the solar array? Right? Well, it depends what, what your definition of active or passive is. Well, it's active when you construct it. It's 
very busy, right? No, I mean, um, are, are you storing or retaining any energy on site? Is there any batteries out there? Oh, no. I, I, I so, so it's still passive. It's yeah. taking direct and going yeah. into the grid. It's, so, yeah, it's going straight into the grid. Power is going into connection point at Snake Hill, and it will straight into the grid. You know, we. I have one system in Arabo Mass right now that I'm building, and it has a half an inch battery with it. It's a pilot program that I was awarded by National Grid through a very competitive uh, RFP. Not necessarily, not necessarily about the price, it's more about system design. And, uh, you know, we have trackers, we have uh, racking trackers, and we have uh, battery storage, and an interactive software that measures weather, microgrid requirements, battery storage, uh, storage release. So that's, I, that I would consider an active system. Sure. And I co-manage it with National Grid. It's going to go online next month. Uh, but that's much different than I'm contemplating here. That's a specific program in Massachusetts that you know, I worked on with National Grid. This is very very docile, very quiet, very inactive. During, during site work and, and the construction process, will there be opportunity for for local personnel to be working? Uh, it sounds like you have the companies. I assume they have their people and their establishments. Yeah, so this particular piece of land is owned by, uh, uh, his name is uh, Joseph Monagro, and he owns a very large site construction company. Uh, part of my lease agreement is he has uh, the exclusive for the site work, as you can imagine, but that doesn't mean uh, you know, his workforce is in Rhode Island, uh, so that doesn't mean that he can't be assisted by me to work with the town to figure out uh, something that works. And I think uh, he would be more than able to do that. He's, he's a very good, he's a young man, very successful. He's a really, really good guy. That's the, that's the owner of the property. Joseph Monaco, yeah. yeah. And he, he owns the site company and he owns the, 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 the land itself. Who's he the one excavating in there prior to? He was, he is, he was mining some gravel up. I know yeah. very well, he is a good gentleman. He's a, good, he's a good man. Do you know his dad or the son? I know his dad. You know his dad. That's who I know with. I know the dad. He's, he's, he's old. Very reputable. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, a, he's a man of iron. Yeah. If you've ever seen his yacht, he's a man of iron. Yeah. He's got everything in the world, even stuff he doesn't I'll need. I'll talk for him. Okay. Yeah, no, he's a good man. Uh, how did you do? He does He does them wild. He does demolition at power plants. Is that how you know him? Uh, I know him through several ways. Some ways. Yeah. So several ways. Several ways. Okay. Fair enough. I do own a I own a world of company. Oh, okay. So yeah. That's how I got you work on his equipment or on some of the job sites? I work for a lot of his friends and whatnot. Yeah. On the job sites. Yeah. For Joe does work in Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York. He's he's yeah, he, I don't big know. Up started off with nothing. He's a pig farmer. I mean, he he's all famous. Started off as a pig farmer. Yeah. Yeah. A real big guy. Good guy equipment. Yeah, I know he's a hard working man. He's a good yeah. guy too, he's a fun one. Yeah. yeah. And they are you well, but no. that's a good question, too. It's good. So, you know, it's, uh, I really appreciate the dialogue. Uh, you know, it, it, again, it makes me think about my business model deeper. Uh, you know, new questions, some new concepts I heard tonight. Um, I'm going to check on that cemetery. Um, uh, and the earthquakes. And the, you know, I, I, keep my, I keep my eyes open on that. Yeah. Uh, so, I will check out these things, and I'll be Ryan and Audi and, and, and Brian, too follow up on that and uh, you know anything else we need to do to keep the dialogue alive. I, I just would close and ask Craig to just say what are our next steps here, Craig, if you could just get a good time. So so the, the next step is is we're as I said, this is a state regulated activity. So in order to get approval to build this, we need to go to the Connecticut Siting Council, which is our immediate next step after leaving here. We would love to be able to include with our uh, siting council application and endorsement of the plan from the two communities um, and be able to bring that forward. Um, obviously, uh, we're expecting that this is going to be a petition filing, which means that it'll be, um, it'll be uh, one of the quicker processes with the, with the state siting council. Uh, that we're hoping that you know within 90 days of filing it, we'll have the approval needed, and hopefully that ends up coinciding with the legislature completing its work and establishing a new program. So hopefully, when we come out of this at the beginning of summer, um, 
will have an approved project ready to construct and we will have a program um, that the project can make application to to sell the electricity. And hopefully, the lady who asked the question is not here, hopefully that will include an opportunity for the town of uh, Plainfield and Sterling, potentially, uh, to benefit by purchasing the electricity at a price less than what they're currently paying. So. Yeah, if I may, this isn't the last opportunity for you to provide public comment. During the site and council process, they do um, request input from the town. <coughs> so they will, whether you, you know, as you stated whether the town wants to endorse it or, or not, at the Siting Council they will request uh, you know, opinions from the town, the various departments. Um, so this is certainly isn't the last forum for public comment at this point. And we will of course um, be forwarding before we file with the Siting Council, we'll be forwarding um, to the First Electman's office in Sterling and to, to the First Electman's office here and our your planner a complete copy of what the application will be so that you can review it and, and have any final uh, you know comments if, as they may be. Thank you for coming tonight.